Hi, everybody. Welcome to Breakout Room 2. My name's Sana. I'm one of the webinar managers here. I'm just waiting for everybody to kind of get into the room and then we can get started. I just want to double check that Kelly's here. Yep, I'm here and I believe I'm recording. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Present. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I've done this so many times and I still can't get it right. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody's in the right room. So just taking attendance. Um, New York Presbyterian Cornell. Are you are you here? Yes, we're here. We're okay. here. Awesome. Uh, Presbyterian Columbia. We're here. Okay. Rutgers. Yes, we're here. Awesome. And then John O'Shea. I know. Yep, I'm here. And then St. Peter's. Do we not have someone from Children's Hospital at St. Peter's in the room? All right, I don't know, maybe they're still sorting people out. So um, we're gonna go ahead and get started and hopefully they'll join us. So each program, like mentioned before, will get about five minutes to present their slide. Um, and I'll give you a, like a one minute warning. So I apologize for interrupting. Um, and then we can go from there and then we'll leave uh, room for questions at the end. But we can go ahead and get started with All right, so I'm first. Um, I wanted to say hello and, and thank you for um, being here this evening. Um, my name is Jennifer DePace and I'm the program director at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell. And um, tonight I'm joined by uh, Dr. Melanie Wilson Taylor, who's somewhere in this room. Um, she is one of the associate program directors. Um, our goal tonight is to be able to share with you, and I think I speak for my colleagues, the other program directors. Um, I am honored to be in this group. Uh, it is a group of really strong programs and you can choose any one of them and get a wonderful education and come out an outstanding clinician. So your job in this, these next few months really is to find the right program for you. And that means um, investigating a little bit and finding out what makes us different. Each of us have a little bit of a, a different um, approach potentially or offerings or something that may fit with your interests. So I'll share with you some of the program highlights today of our program. Um, and you'll learn hopefully much more uh, as you uh, come to see us virtually for a, an interview. We fall into the category that Dr. Barone mentioned of a children's hospital within a larger hospital. We're located physically on the Upper East Side of New York City. Um, we are a large academic center affiliated uh, the hospital is affiliated with a major medical college, Weill Cornell Medicine. And so that is the hub of our learning for our residents. We have 60 residents, so 20 per year. We fall into the category Dr. Barone mentioned of a medium-sized program. Um, most of our residents, if you ask them, will tell you that it feels more like a family-sized program, uh, a smaller program, but um, it is because we really do work hard to get to know each other really well. Um, the main hub of the learning that happens is in the physical location that I mentioned on the Upper East Side of New York City, but we also are fortunate to have very rich relationships with people and institutions um, in the neighborhood that our residents um, visit and learn at. One is Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, 
hospital that cares for children with cancer, as well as hospital for special surgery and orthopedic, rheumatologic, and sports medicine uh, related institution. Our residents also spend time at a community hospital, so very different than the academic center um, on the main campus. Now, we are physically located in um, Manhattan, but what I will share with you is that we serve a very diverse population that comes from um, really all of the boroughs. So our residents in their continuity clinic, for example, uh, their patients come from East Harlem, South Bronx, Western Queens. Um, so really uh, it, you get to see um, a diversity of patients um, racially, ethnically, socioeconomically. We also have some other um, things that we think uh, make our program special, and that's because um, we want for you, in addition to leave being an outstanding clinician, to develop your interests and areas of strength so that you can go on and be a future leader in pediatrics. So we do have um, a required scholarly activity. Our residents all participate in maybe clinical research, um, uh, rigorous quality improvement, and that's a mentored experience over three years. Um, we also have a resident as teacher curriculum that includes both didactics, but as, as well um, an experiential learning piece. One minute. Thank you. It is very important to us as well, as you can see in the boxes on the right, to um, focus on well-being for our residents. And so there is a dedicated wellness curriculum um, as well as support for our, our residents um, in multiple ways. You'll see some of our diversity initiatives. We have a minority health staff council. I'm sure you, you're heal, you're, you will hear more about that tonight from our residents. Um, and really focus on helping you develop skills and well-being and resilience um, during your three years of your training at Cornell. Um, I'm gonna stop there so that we can answer questions and I can um, hand it over to the next program director to chat. Thank you, Jen. Um, so just in case you're confused, uh, we are from New York Presbyterian in Columbia. Uh, we are one hospital system with uh, two separate uh, residency programs. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here today. Um, um, two of our chief residents, uh, Margot and Catherine, will be uh, jumping in. But uh, quick program highlights. We are a tertiary quaternary center uh, embedded in the community of Washington Heights. And that really um, gives you the, um, the complex patients, the specialty patients, while we're also seeing our patients in the community. So you get to see the bread and butter. Um, our clinics, we have four of them. In embedded in our community and we serve our community and uh, that's why you really get to see um, every type of patient and um, every level of patient at the end of the day. Um, our approach, we're very patient-centered, uh, but more importantly, we also resident-driven and they really help us to drive our learning and drive our curriculum and our curriculum changes every year uh, based on uh, what our residents are really interested in. And also every year a class changes because one class comes and one class leaves. And it's important that we continue to adapt to our learners. And our approach is really the growth mindset. It's really pushing everyone to really think about how to continue to grow, to adapt, and we really try to support the learning over the three years. And I'm gonna just leave it up to our chiefs to com uh, commit to everything else. But the one thing that we're really committed to is um, not only diversity, but also our commitment to health equity. And we have it embedded throughout our curriculum. We have unit-based uh, teaching and learning, and um, we discuss patients um, and really explore the issues around um, how we address bias and how we um, really think about social determinants at the end of the day. So it's, uh, it's been a wonderful way to um, continue our learning together with our residents and our patients together. Hi everyone, I'm Catherine. I'm one of the chief residents as Steve mentioned. Um, it's nice to virtually meet you all. I just wanna echo a couple of the things that Steve mentioned and some of the things that really stood out to me in the program over three years and now as a, um, in my fourth year as chief. 
One is the hospital's location. We truly do see about 50%, you know, uh, tertiary, quaternary complex patients, about 50% patients from our local community who live in the surrounding neighborhoods, walk to hospital, the surrounding zip codes in Washington Heights, the Bronx, um, and Harlem. Uh, the second is the resident-driven curriculum. So every year, both the didactics change based on what each class wants and needs, but also the rotations change. We add rotations, we take rotations away, we add residents where more support is needed, et cetera. Um, and then the third thing that I think makes our program really unique is the level of autonomy that our, parent, that our residents are given. Um, I think we're one of the only centers uh, in the country that doesn't have attendings in-house overnight. Um, we of course have attendings easily reachable, happy to come in, or available by phone, um, but it really gives our senior residents uh, a lot of opportunity to make their own decisions with admissions, uh, with clinical changes on the floor, um, and then I just wanted to touch on a couple of the things that Steve mentioned at the end, which are our diversity initiatives, as well as our health equity curriculum. As of last year, we have a health equity curriculum that's embedded in each rotation. So instead of being a separate part of a community peds rotation or um, didactics at, uh, in the morning or at noon, we've incorporated it into bedside learning within each rotation. And then, as he mentioned, we have a diversity and inclusion um, council that's made up of faculty, fellows, and residents. So there's three arms uh, that work together on many initiatives. Uh, and uh, we recently debuted a new um, learning environment bias reporting tool that we're very excited about in order to address some of these issues that our uh, residents and our patients are um, facing on a daily basis. One minute. I think that's actually all that I had to add, um, and we're happy to move on to the next program. Hello, everyone. So I'm Dr. Joanne Carlson. I am the program director at Rutgers, Robert Wood Johnson. I'm proud to be the first program from New Jersey in this group. Um, New Jersey is great too, so remember to keep that in mind when you're looking at programs. So I wanna tell you a little bit about us. Um, we are an academic um, program associated with Rutgers, Robert Wood Johnson. Just a, a phenomenal medical school, um, a very diverse group of students, um, very high scoring, hardworking, um, and really great for our residents to work with. So when you're here, you'll get ample opportunities for teaching. Um, and we also make sure that we um, teach you how to teach the students. And I think our residents as teachers curriculum is a really important part of our program. We are um, smaller than some of the other programs. We are 33 residents with 11 residents per year and two chief residents. So as a resident, you spend your time primarily at the Children's Hospital, which is the Bristol Myers Squibb Children's Hospital. This is a 105 bed children's hospital and I like to call it a free leaning one, meaning that when you're here, you have that experience of being in a separate children's hospital. We have our pediatric floors, our pediatric ER, pediatric radiology, PICU, NICU. But at the same time, we are attached to the adult hospital. We are a referral in center for a lot of New Jersey. So when you're here, um, you'll get a lot of patients from all over New Jersey. Um, there's very few things that we transfer out for. Um, at the moment, we don't do BMT or cardiac surgery. Um, but even BMT is something that our hemonc division is working on. And I think it's a really great experience as a resident to make sure that you can take care of patients, um, you know, from patients who have maybe general peds and kind of basic to the more complex patients as well. We also have all the subspecialties. So no matter what you want to go into, we have those um, specialties here. We do have a few fellowship programs, but not many. So predominantly when you're on elective, you're working one-on-one -on -one with the attendings. And I think that's a really great experience and a great way to really figure out if you wanna go into that subspecialty. So I wanna kind of tell you my top five um, favorite things about our program. I think first of all is definitely the people. We have a really strong, dedicated, hardworking group of residents who really wanna be the best pediatricians they can be. And I think as faculty, that makes our job even easier and certainly rewarding to work with them and, and really see them grow over their three years. 
I think at the same time, the faculty are very supportive and really get excited to work with the residents, um, especially if you have somebody who wants to go into your field, you can just see that they go out of their way to, to really help that person. And then even stepping back, I think the pharmacists and nurses and nutritionists, all of our support staff um, is just a really wonderful group to work with and really adds to the team and, and family atmosphere of our program. My second highlight is our REACH rotation, which is our resident ed education, advocacy, and community health. So I think this is a wonderful experience for the residents where they really get to work in the community. They go to places from community health fairs to um, food pantries to take part in education. Our great pediatricians, Dr. Pai, who actually has a leadership role in the AAP for all of New Jersey, who runs the rotation and is a great mentor um, for anyone interested in advocacy. Next highlight is, is definitely wellness. So I think everybody needs more wellness um, during the pandemic. So it's something we definitely try to emphasize for our residents. We have six um, at least protected times during block lecture where the residents have different wellness activities from painting to dancing to ice cream to just free time, as well as just having different wellness speakers. We have an active behavioral health program if anyone needs counseling, and then a lot of different check-ins with um, members of the department from social workers to psychiatrists, just to make sure the residents have the support they need. Mm -hmm. Next highlight is diversity. I think that's something that we also um, are really working hard with. Um, our department has a departmental task force that is basically has a goal to increase diversity and inclusion in our department, working with faculty, helping the residents. Um, and one of the things that's come out of this is an educational series as part of our case conference, specifically focused on diversity, small groups, um, really educating and, and helping learn um, more about it. And then finally, our last highlight is um, we were so proud that this past year, our board pass rate went up to 100%. And that's something we were working really hard with our residents on education and making sure that they were prepared. So it's something where we're very proud about. And then finally, what happens um, post-residency? So our residents, usually about 50% go into gen peds and about 50% go into subspecialty. Um, we have had just phenomenal fellowship matches across the country in the last few years, including places like Memorial Sloan Kettering, CHOP, Stanford, um, DuPont. So I think it's a, a really good testament to how great the residents are and, and how hard they work to see where they've matched. Did I, did I miss my one minute warning? Am I in one minute? Yeah, you did. It's okay. <laughs> okay. And that's all I have to say, but thank you so much for organizing and happy to answer any questions at the end. Hi everyone, I'm Amrit. I'm one of the pediatric chief residents here at um, UBMD Pediatrics and uh, Oshai Children's Hospital in Buffalo, New York. Um, Dr. Bree Kramer is our associate program director and she was the one who was supposed to be um, holding this webinar for us, but unfortunately um, she's also working in the ICU tonight and um, one of her patients coded. So I just got roped in about 10 minutes ago and I'm looking at this poster for the first time today. <laughs> um, but as a brief um, introduction, um, our program director for the past few years has been Dr. Black and he is currently stepping down and Dr. Kramer is taking his place. Um, and our program coordinator is Laura Camp. So the big highlights for our program is that we have a four plus one schedule we have uh, about, we are about a medium sized program with about 45 total residents. Um, 40 of them are pediatrics and then we usually have um, one or two uh, peds neuro. Um, we divide them up into cohorts and then what they usually do is they have four week blocks of inpatient or core rotations. Um, and some of them can be elected time and then they have um, one week of clinic and those clinic sessions, those clinic week sessions uh, consist of about uh, five to six half days of um, actual clinic time. And then the rest of the clinic days are divided up into a longitudinal um, schedule that includes advocacy, resilience, um, professional development, and board prep. 
Um, we definitely have been working uh, to have a um, robust advocacy curriculum in the past few years. Um, and we have about 80 to 90 percent of our residents who are now involved in advocacy projects. Additionally, we are also working with um, QI initiatives as well. And this year we have uh, started enrolling all our residents into uh, QI projects. Um, in terms of what OSHAI is, OSHAI is a freestanding children's hospital here in Buffalo, New York. Um, it's about a 200 bed facility and we do have a good encatchment area that includes um, the southern region of uh, uh, Southern Ontario, as well as upstate New York, and a bit of the um, uh, Pennsylvania regions as well. So we do get a lot of diversity and our residents do get to see a lot of pathology. Um, we are a level three NICU with about 64, uh, 64 to 65 beds. And um, we are a facility that um, does have a focus on both um, resident education as well as um, our other um, wellness and resilience sort of um, trying to maintain a balance between those two. Um, we, in terms of our career paths, we do have about the majority of our residents that go into fellowship. Um, and we do have a good fellowship match rate at around 60 to 70%. Um, and then we are um, working on uh, just um, continuing our um, uh, residents in um, our residents as a teacher's curriculum for this year. Sorry, I did not get time to prepare. So I'm just kind of going along. Um, but any questions, please reach out to us. And um, Dr. Kramer's email address is listed before below. I don't know if um, the program director or, or residents from St. Peter's are here right now. Um, I'll give them a second. <laughs> it looks like, looks like they're not here. So what we can do is move on to the Q&A portion of it. And I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen so we can all see each other. Um, so please feel free to either type your questions or um, just start talking. I just want to say St. Peter's is down the street from our hospital and it is a, a lovely hospital. Um, they do have a really strong NICU if anyone is interested in NICU. Um, I listened to their presentation last year and it sounds like they have a, a really great community of, of residents. Um, and New Brunswick is just a, a great diverse trace place to train. So um, St. Peter's- And I'm gonna, I'm gonna add to that. I went to medical school at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson and did my, um, medical school rotations and pediatrics at St. Peter's. It was a long time ago, but what I can tell you is that um, Dr. Bernstein was my, one of my mentors um, at the time and is a fantastic pediatrician um, and advisor and certainly I'm sure a program director, so. Do you feel the love in pediatrics? So we have one question pop up in the chat. Um, someone asked, how would you say the diversity of the residency class represents that of the population that they serve? Of course, any res uh, program can respond. If all programs wanna respond, that's great too. So I'll just say for ours, I mean, we only have 11 residents per year. I think New Brunswick is a pretty diverse population, but um, has a very strong Hispanic population. And um, this past year we recruited at least three URMs. So I think we would have, you know, maybe about a quarter of our um, residency class is Hispanic and, and Spanish speaking as well. So um, probably not as high as the community, but it's something that we're actively increasing and we've increased our kind of numbers of, of URMs each year. I mean, the honest answer is it's, it's never matches. Um, I think that uh, if you add uh, Latinx, plus uh, black applicants is about 11 to 12% per year. And our community um, here in Washington Heights is probably going to be uh, at least 80% Latinx plus um, African-American black. So, I mean, what, you know, we are um, 
need a better pipeline at the end of the day. And I think that um, that is the goal for all of us. Uh, but the representation um, is uh, something that all of us are committed to uh, in all of these in all of our programs, um, but definitely does not match our communities. Um, I guess I'll move on to another question in the chat. Can you comment on any formal systems that your program has in place for helping residents who face bias or microaggressions from patients or other staff? I, I don't know if this fully answers the question, but we do have implicit bias training for our residents, um, the same things that our faculty go over. So basically sessions to try to teach and um, discuss these topics. But then also with our diversity inclusion series, we have um, uh, small groups that we divide into and, and let the residents um, you know, talk about situations that they've been in, as well as our departmental task force, which is there then to, to help as, as these situations arise. Hi everyone, I'm Margo. I'm one of the pediatric chief residents at Columbia. And we are just recently rolled out in um, no threshold reporting system where we, any of our residents or medical students, faculty members are able to report any aggression, microaggression that they experience. And it's reviewed by our Office of Medical Education, Diversity and Inclusion so that we have a very low threshold that everybody feels like they can report things safely. Okay, um, next question. How is step one being evaluated this year with the transition to pass fail for the next cycle? And I'm just guessing, but I, I'm assuming that I, I've heard a lot of concerns with, um, even though it's not pass fail this year that some residency programs are trying to like transition their thinking of how they understand step one and how they take that into account. So I'm assuming that's what the person is wondering. Yeah, and I, I'm, uh, I'll address the question, I think more broadly that um, I, I think we would all encourage you not to worry about any one particular piece um, of your application, especially a test score. Um, all of us, I think, and part of the mission that Steve described is, is um, wanting to do better and recruiting um, a diverse group of interns and making sure that we are looking at your activities and interests and putting together a diverse group of interests, right, in our programs. Um, I, I think there are very few of us that look at any one particular thing and say, oh, you know, let's, let's not look at that applicant. We take a, a holistic approach um, and very carefully, we spend a lot of time on your application. So um, spend time on your personal statement and tell us what your interests are, where you see yourself um, a few years down the road. Um, that's really, I think, what will get you the interview um, more so than, than any one score on any test. I would have to agree, you know, based on my experience of working with, you know, so many residents and now um, new attendings, um, you know, down the line, um, one isolated test score here and there really doesn't define you. And it's really just like the overall picture of who you are and, um, like uh, Ms. Jennifer said, just kind of keep working on um, just developing a really holistic approach to your application and you, you should be fine. Yeah, I think the, uh, the great thing about pediatrics is as a uh, community, uh, we've really moved to value-based and holistic review of applications. And that's why it often takes us so long to send out interviews because we're actually reading everything that you put in there. Um, so uh, we value all the time that people are putting in um, and we work really hard to make sure that we're getting uh, the best sense of who you are. The great thing about um, COVID, the silver linings is that now they have combined your MSPE with your application. So it really gives us 
uh, the, the most complete uh, version of you. And um, I mean, I could say for our program personally, I mean, we have not used a USMLE um, cut off uh, in the last five years. Um, so, you know, I think that really speaks to most of our programs um, in the New York area and also around the country. So. And I'll just add that I think the interview is, is really a great way for us to get to know people. And I think everyone would agree in pediatrics, it's, it's usually a really fun experience. I mean, we just want to get to know you and love hearing your stories and, and want you to hear us and, and really see if it's a good fit. So I think your interview is, is really a great chance for you to shine and, and let your personality come through. Okay, the New York, New Jersey area has so many programs. How do applicants figure out whether programs are friendly to URM candidates, DOs, IMGs, et cetera? I mean, I think the best way too is, is to look at websites. I mean, I know there are a lot of websites out there that have the statistics, but you know, go to the program websites. You can see you know, many of the residents who are there, see who they've accepted before. Know, reach out to people from your medical schools. Um, you know, I would say probably most of the people on this call will say we accept all of those. And, you know, most of us, I think, have a pretty much open mind. So I, I would definitely keep your options open. But I do think the websites have a lot of great information. And then is there any housing or support for area housing for any programs? Um, I'll, I'll speak uh, about Cornell. Um, so the um, we do have housing available for residents and there's um, a few buildings within the neighborhood from which our residents can choose. Um, the plus side of having housing in the area is that um, many of our residents choose to live there. It's It's very convenient. Um, it, their commute to work is, is less than five minutes, so it maximizes your sleep. Um, for us, though, as well, I, I think it, it brings uh, an added dimension to the program. Our residents get to know each other really well um, outside of work because they live in close proximity to each other, so they spend time going to the gym, going to dinner. When they have a bad day at work, they might knock on their neighbor's door to, to chat about it. So um, not all of our residents choose to, to live in housing. Some of them do live off campus. Um, the housing at Cornell is offered. The, when you look at the rents, uh, it's probably at market um, price compared to other neighbor, uh, buildings in the neighborhood. At Columbia, we also have housing available in the neighborhood. About a third of our residents end up living in the Washington Heights neighborhood, whether it's in the hospital housing, uh, which is at, offered at a relatively good rate compared or for New York City. About a third live somewhere in Manhattan and then about a third live a little bit farther away. Um, in addition to the option of housing provided by the hospital, we also get a housing stipend twice a year um, to help offset the cost of housing as I'm sure you're all aware it's quite expensive in New York City. Okay, I'm not from the area, I'm from Florida, so I'm not fully uh, sure what this question is asking, but is there an equivalent to the New York 12 week rule in New Jersey? I do not understand the question either as one of the New Jersey programs. If I don't know if my New York people can help me. No, yeah, I'm in New York. I don't, Steve, do you know the 12 week rule? Margarita, are you able <laughs> to tell us? Happy to Google it. Yes, I sure, of course, sorry, I um, assumed. So it has to do with um, if you do more than 12 weeks of clerkships uh, outside of your medical school, that's mainly for IMGs, you can't, um, be licensed in New York um, for residency. So a lot of programs have that on their website saying if you've done that, you can't apply. Uh, so I was wondering if New Jersey has any similar rule. All I can say is not that I know of. Um, I'm happy to look into that more, Margarita, and I'll, I'll put my email and you're welcome to then just email me directly. But I honestly, I'd never heard of it. The New York people, have you heard of that? I think she's talking about the APPD recommendations where if your school has a home institution, they don't want away rotations to uh, 
they only want you to do one rotation. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a rule about if you have a home institution, you're only supposed to only allowed to do one away rotation, um, not to supersede four weeks. But if you don't have a home institution, I think you can do up to like uh, three. My institution does that. That's that's the only thing I can think of. There's a comment in the chat that also explains it too. Yeah, it has to do with the New York State Department. So it's it, you can't train in New York if you've done more than 12 weeks outside of your country. So I was wondering if New Jersey has anything similar. I will certainly look into it. Please, um, I'll put my email and you can email me. OK, are there any new and upcoming changes to the program, whether that's curriculum, resources, et cetera, that will take place prior to when we would begin in July? I think as we mentioned a little bit in our brief program overview, we, we make changes kind of as they, the needs arise. Um, so there very well could be changes that come up before July, but nothing major that we're anticipating right now. Yeah, I would say the same thing. I mean, we're constantly evaluating our program. So there are individual changes within the curriculum, but nothing that's so outstanding that would change your mind about whether or not you'd be interested or not interested in our program. Okay, how does your program approach couples in the match, particularly couples applying in different specialties? I mean, I think we're happy for everyone to apply. Um, you know, if there's uh, another program in our um, institution that there are other couples interested in, I'm happy to kind of also find out as much as I can about the other program, but um, I think we encourage everyone to apply, certainly. If you see the number of go ahead after you no we might be saying the same thing i i think we welcome um of course those who are applying through the couples match um please do know though that um we do have lots of power program directors but not not that much where we we, may, we ha are happy to send an email to um the corresponding program director of your partner um, but other than that, there's there's not a lot often that we can do to um, other than say we interviewed so and so and really loved him or her. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a tough situation sometimes. I mean, that being said, uh, the best thing about the New York, New Jersey area is you saw how many dots there were in the area and um, we have a lot of residents who have couples matched into different institutions. So, and uh, they, they make it work really well. Uh, so luckily we have so many programs in New York um, that um, it really doesn't become a factor um, because, you know, people really get to match into New York City or in the New York, New Jersey area. So I wouldn't worry too much in New York. Um, so just a fun question from me. What is your favorite place to eat and what is your favorite place to do around your program? Oh, that's an unfair one. Steve Paik is like the biggest foodie. So, um, <laughs> but I'm going to let Melanie take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I am more of a, um, well, what I would say about the area that we're in is, is actually every time you walk out the door, there's like a new restaurant. Um, so um, that is probably one of the advantages of being downstate and um, in the Upper East Side. There literally is a restaurant every step along the way. So I have encouraged residents to sort of walk out the door, go right, and every day pick something new, go left, pick something new. Um, but I'm more of the Thai <laughs> person. And so I like a lot of the Thai food in the area. So I love Indian food. So um, there are Indian food um, very close to the hospital, but um, if I had a pick, my favorite would be Taqueria, which is like a fun taco burrito, um, kind of modern um, place uh, nearby that you can get takeout. And they do like a fun taco bar, which is good for Fridays when your attendings buy you uh, lunch. And then favorite activity, I would say is apple picking. Uh, New Jersey has a lot of great farms and everything. And it's been a, a really good 
social event for the residents. Um, if you've never been apple picking, great apple cider, apple crisp, lots of good apple desserts. Uh, for, for New York, uh, where we are, um, there's a little red lighthouse um, they're down uh, near the GW Bridge. Uh, it's a nice walk and people do wellness walks down there. Um, a lot of actually faculty do that. Uh, but my favorite restaurant in Washington Heights is on 175th and Broadway. It's called El Malacón. It's a Dominican restaurant. And uh, when you walk by, about a block away, you can actually smell the rotisserie chicken from a block away and, and you know you're in a good place right there, so. I want to tackle the question um, that just came from Anna. It's a really great question. I've heard that residents in New York do their own phlebotomy. Is this true? Would definitely need some tips. Um, I think as program directors, um, you know, we, we're not always in the know about what's kind of going on in social media and blogs, but I, I know certainly there is this um, potential concern that the, there's a lot of quote unquote service activity that goes on in some of our programs. Um, I will, I'll speak for um, New York Presbyterian and, I, and I'll speak for Cornell primarily uh, that um, we have worked really hard to be able to put the resources into place so that we have the right sized ancillary staff um, to be able to support the residents in their work with phlebotomy, you know, transporting patients, all of those things that would you would typically think um, of as not necessarily um, educational per se. However, I think it is also important when we think about procedures, um, there is a, the, a, a right number where we want to make sure that our residents get exposed to them. And I think for a little while we did overshoot and our residents weren't getting enough procedures. And so we're trying really to find that balance. How many IVs do you need to do really in order to feel comfortable so that when you go to fellowship and um, in critical care, you're not putting in your first central line before your first IV. Um, but it is, it is something we surveil regularly and advocate for changes when we need to. Don't believe the hype. Um, we actually have to have add electives for procedures to actually get enough. So um, it's pediatrics, I don't think, uh, in New York. So it looks like everybody is back from the breakout rooms. We really hope that all of you had a chance to learn a lot of wonderful things about all the great 